brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in the Quran about the potholes and the impediments that we are likely to encounter in this journey that we call life. And for us as Muslims, those potholes are deep and they seem to become deeper every passing week. I for one am very pleased that the man survived and that uh, at worst he might lose an eye and he would be back to normal. Think about what would have happened if had he died. Just the attack on him garnered so much sympathy in the Western world. Prime ministers and presidents were tripping over themselves to extend their well, -wishing, well wishes to him and to his family. And think about what would have been the situation had he died. There would probably be a street named after him in some major European city and a town center named after him somewhere else. And who knows, they might even erect a statue in memory of Rushdi. And all of this because we could not control our sentiments, if that is indeed the case, or once again, we've become instruments in a global conflict between different political powers. Allah knows best whether it is case one or case two, but certainly the, we as Muslims globally, and perhaps in this case, Muslims in the West more so, we become victims of this. It happens once too often. But Allah reminds us in the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Ahasib al nasu an yutraku an yaqulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun. Do people believe that they will be left to be simply by pronouncing faith? That is not the case. You will be constantly tested. And the tests come in all shapes and forms. We live lives of comfort, perhaps more so than any other Muslim community in any other part of the world. We live well. We are physically protected. We have a great health system, I think, and so on. But our identity is always challenged. Our identity is always challenged. This encounter that we've just been part of is one that goes back to the very beginnings of Islam. It goes back to the time of the Crusades. It goes back to the time of colonialism. And at different points in our time, we've re reacted to this differently. So we take, for example, the events that transpired in Muslim Spain around the year 850, when about 48 or 49 Christians took it upon themselves to publicly insult and blaspheme the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which you would admit is not something you would want to do in the streets of Pakistan or Iraq nowadays. But at the time, it took all of 10 to 12 years before they were ultimately executed. They were executed. But the story itself is very interesting. For it talks about Muslim behavior when Muslims are in power and Muslim behavior when Muslims become disempowered. During this time, Islam controlled the Iberian Peninsula, which is now Spain and Portugal. And for those not knowing, this is, some, this is a part of the world we controlled for almost seven centuries, from the year 711 onwards. Jews ought to be reminded, I would say in passing, that this was actually the golden era in Jewish history. There are two golden eras in Jewish history. They're living the, the second golden era now. And the first golden era was Muslim control of Spain. So during that time, some Christians took it upon themselves to publicly, 
to publicly insult the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you want to get under the skin of, the, of, the, of, of a Muslim, there are two th ways of doing that. One is to impugn the Qur'an, which is what Rushdie did. But perhaps more effective is to impugn the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With regard to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Muslim's fuse is very short. Very short. But notwithstanding that, that entire group of Christians went through a process that was entirely uh, uh, legal, transparent. Their leaders were brought in. The judicial system were kicked in. And eventually, they refused to renounce, and they were executed. So this is how Muslims behaved at a time when they were empowered. But when they were becoming disempowered in a place like India, for instance, and someone decided to take it upon himself to, to impugn the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by writing a book called Rangila Rasul, flamboyant prophet, and uh, some Muslim took it upon himself to kill him. So these are two examples of periods in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is targeted, but in which our behavior has changed. The focus is on the fact that we have, we can't control our temperament, we can't control our anger, depending on our own situation as a community. During moments in which we are empowered, we exercise restraint. And during moments in which we are embarrassed, humiliated, when the British, British had taken control of India, and we no longer determine the destiny, not just of Muslims, but all of India, these are moments at which we were weak and our only response was to lash out. And that's not necessarily a good thing. It's easier said than done, I understand. But ultimately, if you lose control of yourself, you lose control of the situation. If you lose control of yourself, you lose control of your situation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one asked, Awsini Ya Rasul Allah, Give me some, some advice, Ya Rasulullah. He says, La taghdab. So don't get angry. He asks again, something else. It seemed pretty simple. He says, No, La taghdab. And he said that three, three times. If you do get angry, and most human beings are, they fall foul of that, you have to find a way to control it. This unfortunate saga is uh, an indication of our own rise and fall and hopefully our rise again inshallah so the first time we encountered this was in the early 80s when the book itself comes out and if not for that fatwa that very very unfortunate fatwa the, the book might have just died a miserable death in, on bookshelves. But that was a trigger mechanism. It riled the entire Muslim world. And because a Shia Imam decided to make a fatwa, Sunnis had to respond in some way that was equally filled with gusto and uh, love and so on for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they did what they normally do. They decided to destroy property and kill fellow Muslims, to destroy property that belonged to Muslims and to kill fellow Muslims. Very unfortunate. Alhamdulillah, the second time around, I think we've matured. The important thing is not to lament on any single event. It is always more important to look at the way in which we have improved as a community or as individuals. Have we taken a lesson from our past experiences? And I think in this case we have. There might, there might have been one of us who lashed out and attacked this person. But for the most part, globally, at least today it seems, there's been some restraint. 
And this is important for us, particularly those who live in the West. Because we try to live our lives in which we are good citizens, practicing Muslims, and exemplars of Islam. That's the most important element. To, sh to show people that we exemplify the, the better part of Islam. To do that, you have to act and behave with dignity. Again, the Quran tell, uh, tells us in Surah Al Furqan, I think it is, وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ He says, don't go around impugning other people's fates. Don't go around impugning other people's fates, lest they, 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 they respond in kind. They do the same thing. This puts us at a disadvantage, and a very honorable disadvantage. For there is no other religion, at least known to me, that commands its followers not to go around impugning other people's religions. You can certainly criticize a religion objectively, academically. The Quran does that all the time with Christianity and Judaism. But you have to confer the necessary dignity and respect to all religions, regardless of how absurd they may seem to you. Do not engage in this. So this puts us at a, at, at, at a commendable disadvantage. We have to be proud of the fact that we go into this argument with one hand tied behind our backs. We don't have the right to lash out. We don't have the right to impugn. We don't have the right to insult. We have to just accept that, either walk away if we cannot hold our own, or provide a dignified response. Again, the Quran tells us, وَالَّذِينَ يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا Muslims are those who do not bear witness to falsities or falsehood. And if they happen to come by any kind of behavior that is mocking, jeering, humiliating, they walk away with dignity. That should be the practice of Muslims living in the West. Not necessarily cowering and running away, but you have to engage someone with dignity. The problem with the book, however, the book, the entire book was, for those who've had the time to actually look at it, it's a book that is built on parody, mocking. The idea was to take every symbol of Islam and mock it in a way that shows that the religion in its entirety is just meaningless. That's a difficult, very difficult challenge to accept and defend. But you know, he's been duly rewarded, has, he was knighted by the queen, and he's gonna go down in history as someone who changed the course of discourse in the public square, and he's done that. At our expense, I might say, but he's done that. Our learning experience is to know how to respond to such outbursts in the future. If only we take the time and the resources and dedicate them to responding to this, because this is not the end of the saga, it will go on. It will go on. And we should always remember that the response should be measured, it should be dignified, it should be respectful, it should not be filled with scorn, it should not be filled with humiliation. Wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.